uh, yeah, we're doing a series of, of Bible studies, uh, and, uh, and so one of the questions that comes in a study naturally is the question of, uh, can we trust the Bible? Uh, and this is a basic question, uh, a basic question that, uh, you know, still has uh, an importance to us, even if you've been a Christian for a long time. But it's also a question everybody has to ask at some point in their uh, journey. Uh, and, you know, when we talk about, uh, when we talk about the Bible and uh, we talk about the importance of the Bible, uh, really, we, when we look at the Bible, it's really no other book has impacted history uh, like uh, the Bible has. Uh, the Bible is not just, uh, for us as Christians, it's not just any book. But it is a special book, a book that contains the knowledge of God and contains for us something that is vital for our walk. Second Timothy 3, 16 and 17, uh, we read, it says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so we as Christians, we look to the Bible as being our guide, our guide for, for, for reproof and for correction, for instruction. When we look at what's going on in the world today, we see the world in large measure having no moral compass. It is floating about in the morass of everybody's opinions. We live in a postmodern world where people believe that truth is optional and that you can just believe whatever you want, and when all that matters is that you're sincere, right? And yet, I think most of us understand that if we throw truth out the window, then what do we have left? Imagine going to the doctor's office, and uh, the doctor says, well, we're not really sure, you know, what to do. You're going to a heart surgeon who's ready to do heart surgery, and will say, well, we're going to give it a good shot, right? I've been reading some manuals. And I think I got a handle to this thing. We should be fine. How many of you would be excited to get the heart surgery? Right? If you go to a judge and the judge says, you know what, I just don't feel this right now. I think that you're just wrong. Right? And had no basis for law to follow. How many of you know that we would have chaos in the courts? We have chaos to some degree now. But just imagine if there wasn't a law to reference. Right? When we look at society as a whole, see, we may agree and, and often disagree with all the crazy laws that get passed, including lately with you know, a lot of the health restrictions. But the reason that these laws get passed is to try to have an orderly you know, and constructive society where everybody can respect each other and work together. Does that make sense? And so things like laws can't just change willy-nilly. Unfortunately, we also live in a time, as I mentioned at the beginning, with no moral compass, where politicians then are ready to throw out values that are we've held dear for a long time. And we understand that some of those consequences are going to be bad. And if we believe in the Bible, as we do, hopefully here, as hopefully you do if you're watching this, we also understand that when we throw, when we disregard God, when we disregard uh, what God you know, God has, has told us, especially as found in the Bible, we end up being floating around. Uh, they'd be essentially the same as if you were in a boat with no anchor. Um, I don't know how many fishermen you have. He, I have here today, but I know, you know, I've been fishing since I was, I was a kid with my, with my dad. There's a time when you might just want to float around, but usually you're trolling. Usually you're going in a direction if you're not trolling, you want to put down an anchor so you can stay in one spot. Otherwise, what happens is the waves are going to keep pushing you and pushing you until you end up hitting the shore. And then you have to turn your motor on and push yourself or row if you're unfortunate not to have a motor. Get yourself back out. And then the process repeats itself. Well, really, in a way, morality and morally speaking, this thing is happening. We're getting pushed by the culture. We're getting pushed by the sea of everybody's opinion and we are headed towards rocks, and then it's not hard to understand how we can shipwreck. Now, in a small fishing boat, it's no big deal if you hit the rocks. But if you've got a big ship, and you just float along and hit the rocks, you have a much more serious problem. As we saw not 
you know, even recently in the Suez, where, where these ships are getting turned sideways and then they're blocking, right, because of the winds and, and other things. And, and some of it is, is navigational error and, and the like. The point is, is that in that same way for us, if we don't have an anchor to guide us, then we're going to find ourselves shipwrecking or we're going to find ourselves on a sandbar stuck. And that's what happens, I believe, and, and as Christians, we believe when it comes to, to disregarding the Bible. You see, we're coming at it from a perspective that God is creator and God is king of kings and lord of lords. He's the one who created all things. That's what scripture tells us. That's what the Bible tells us. And so if it's, that, if it's true that he created all things, which I believe it is, then doesn't it stand to reason that we should learn from him what is right and what is wrong and what we should do and what we shouldn't do and what we should avoid and the pitfalls? Doesn't that make sense? So when we talk about the Bible being the most popular, or um, sorry, the most influential book, it also happens to be a book that gets attacked more than anything. We have this quote from Bernard Ram. He says, no other book has been so chopped, knifed, sifted, scrutinized, and vilified. What book on philosophy or religion or psychology or belle lettre of classical or modern times has been subject to such a mass attack as the Bible, with such venom and skepticism, with such thoroughness and erudition upon every chapter, line, and tenant? It's interesting. No one attacks the Quran. Okay, no one attacks the Quran. You won't find secular people attacking the Book of Mormon. And the reason they don't attack the Quran or the Book of Mormon is because, you know, there's there's something deeper, I believe, about the Bible. Why has it been so aided? We get a clue in Revelation 12, 17. It says, The dragon was enraged with a woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So this war, we as Seventh-day Adventists, we talk about that as the great controversy. And so there's this great battle, this great war, this great controversy between Satan and God. And so if God has provided us in the Bible words of life, right? If he's provided us words of life, doesn't it make sense then that if God has this adversary, Satan, who's making war with him, that he would do everything he could to discredit the words of life, right? And so this is why we find ourselves in society. Ultimately, they're, they're upset by what they find in the Bible because the Bible is actually con condemning their actions and speaking against it. Now, the Bible is also the first among all other books ever written as far as the preeminence of the Bible, the first place. Uh, here's some stats for you guys. It's the most translated uh, book um, this uh, stats from 2019, the Bible had been fully translated in 692 languages. 692 languages in addition, 1,547 languages have the New Testament. And if we, talk, we also include shorter portions of Scripture, they're available in a further 1,123 languages, which gives us a grand total of 3,362 languages, which have some portion of Scripture available uh, to them. And the reason why we have all these languages in it is because we have understood as Christians that we want every tribe, nation, language, and tongue to be able to understand the Bible. And we've been working at this for hundreds of years in order to be able to get it. But no other book is translated in anywhere near as many languages as the Bible is. And it's the same when it comes to printing of the Bible. Globally, from 2015 to 2019, over 184 million full Bibles were distributed by Bible societies around the world. A large portion of those actually being in, in uh, Central and South America, interestingly enough. But, you know, even in, in North America, it was 16 million copies of the Bible, full Bibles that were distributed by Bible societies. And this doesn't include churches, and it doesn't include individuals who are giving Bible and getting them printed. The Bible has been the bestseller all along for decade after decade after decade. And one of the reasons for it is because the Bible is a life-transforming book. It's not just another book. Some people might look at the Bible and say, well, you know, I don't read books that were written 20 years ago. Why am I going to read something that was written 2,000 years ago? But I'm here to tell you that the difference between a book that was written 20 years ago and, a book, and this book that was written 2,000 years ago is that this Bible, the Bible that, that we have, either electronically or in person, this Bible that we hold in our hands, has, is the Word of God Himself. And there is a supernatural element to that word. And just to finish off the, the, the stats here, the Bible was written by over 40 authors over a period of 1,500 years. 
and yet has amazing agreement from the first book of Genesis to the last one. It's really challenging to write a sermon on trusting the Bible uh, and to keep it concise and also to keep it uh, interesting. Okay, because you could easily, I could easily get into like a university style lecture because I have some of the books I reference, one of them, Evidences uh, by Josh McDowell and, and Sean McDowell, they, they wrote like 1,000, I think it's like 1,800 pages or 1,400 pages of evidence, okay, and, uh, and all kinds of stuff. We could get into the looking at the resurrection and why it's true. We could look at, you know, the origins of, of copying and textual analysis and why that's true. I could get into all kinds of detail that would get you glossed over in your eyes and, and longing for lunch in a hurry, okay? <laughs> but I'm, what I'm, I'm going to try to do is just the 30,000-foot view to just hit some highlights. And if you need or want more resources, we can make those uh, available to you. If you find yourself being one of those types of people that really next needs to drill down and get, and get more detail. But one thing I can promise you, no matter what, the evidence is there if you're willing to find it and look for it, if you're willing to have an open mind. The Bible is a supernatural book with supernatural insight needed. Okay, this is the other key that that's some people that are skeptics, or I would say all people that are skeptical of the Bible, when they're coming to the Bible, they're coming to it with their own natural uh, selves. Now, if you follow at all what, what I've been preaching about, we all know that there's a sinful human nature in all of us. There is a nature within humanity that is at war with God and is not, is not uh, you know, friendly to God or the things of God. And so if we read the Bible through our natural selves without the help of God, we're going to come at the Bible and see it as foolishness. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. And this is the thing. You could go online and you could look for the problems in the Bible, and you can find lots and lots of people who have written even entire books about how the Bible is nonsense and here's why you don't believe the Bible in the whole nine years. But the thing is, is you have to look at the, the, these people and ask yourselves, well, if they, do, they have, do they believe in God? The majority of them don't, okay? And if, you, if they do claim to believe in God and yet they're, they're denying key aspects of the Bible, we have a problem. For instance, in the 19th century, people came, a lot of, of theologians a lot of Bible scholars came to the belief that miracles don't happen today. And they came to this, this understanding by saying, hey, when I look outside, when I interact with people, I've never heard of anybody being raised from the dead. I've never heard of anybody being fed by the 5,000. I've never seen anybody walk on water. I've never seen this sea part. Therefore, if it doesn't happen today, it didn't happen back then. The ancients were just ignorant, and they just made stuff up. Okay. And on that basis, then, they just came up with a whole thing to just deny everything about Scripture. But the argument, the counter-argument to that, I would say, is, okay, um, how much percentage of the world do you think you know right now? Would you, would you think that, uh, would it be fair to say that you know 1%? Who here thinks they know 1% of all the knowledge of the world? I hope nobody raises their hand. I don't even think that you could take a guy like Einstein or the smartest people that have ever existed and be able to come up with 1%. I don't even think it's 0.1%, okay? It's probably closer to 0.00000000000 and you could add a bunch of zeros, 1%. I mean, you just take something like an iPhone, okay? Do you think that God could create an iPhone? Do you think it would be easy or hard for God to create an iPhone? Right? He'd speak it into existence. Hello? If God can speak the entire world into existence, do you think an iPhone would be hard for him? No, it'd be a piece of cake. But who here could build an iPhone from scratch? No help. Not even the engineers at Google could do that, or, or sorry, at Apple could do that. They're sitting on the shoulders of tens of thousands of people who have developed computers and developed the electronics and all that and have gone through all the engineering training, everything, and it's a whole team of, of probably 100,000 people that work in order to make this happen, right? Now, I bring this up because when you're talking about this knowledge, isn't it possible for these skeptics of, of, uh, of you know, miracles, 
Isn't it possible that in the 99.9999999% of the knowledge they don't know, that the knowledge of God could be there? Does that make sense? I don't think I'm making a leap here when I say that, right? So the Bible has supernatural origins. And 2 Peter 1.19 tells us this. It says, We have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And so then this Bible that we hold, that's why as Christians we see it as being the inerrant word of God. Even though God spoke through human beings, it was God moving on those human beings. It worked through certainly the personality and the life experiences of those human beings. But the end product was one that was blessed and led by God, inspired by God, so that when we read the words that we have in Scripture, we are reading the words of God. That makes sense? And that's what makes reading the scriptures, um, a something that is worthwhile for us. God predicts that secular people would find the Bible foolish. We saw that already in 1 Corinthians, right? 1 Corinthians uh, 2. But um, if we read just the chapter before, in 1 Corinthians 1, 18 uh, to 21, we see, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, did I find it? No, I'm not on the right one. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. What does this all mean? It's okay if people think the Bible's foolish. I can sleep well at night. I hope you can too. Okay? People will interact with the Bible and they won't get it. Sometimes I, in, as part of this preparation, I went looking at contradictions that people find in Scripture. And 99 times out of 100, the people that find contradictions in Scripture, it's because they don't understand Scripture. And so then they read one thing and they read another and they see a, what they think is a contradiction, but there's actually a good, rational, plausible explanation for those things that they read. Just one small example would be the fact that in the Gospels, we find some discrepancy in, uh, you know, some of the things you read, minor discrepancies like the womb and then one Gospel saying that they're, they're not at the tomb and, and people are saying, well, wait a minute, are they at the tomb? Or are they not at the tomb? But see, one of the things we have to keep in mind in that regard is that this is eyewitness accounts. And one of the things that, that, for instance, police officers know is if they go to interview four people, and if all four people have the same story, guess what they know? They're hiding something. Because no four people can ever have the same story on anything. Okay? And so actually, these little discrepancies that we see, not the main message, the main message is still there, it's clear, but these little things that we see, they remember different aspects of the story, is actually proof that we're looking at an authentic document and not a made-up document, as one example of the contradictions we could find. And R.C. or J.C. Ryle has this to say. He says, be very sure of this. People never reject the Bible because they cannot understand it. They understand it only too well. They understand that it condemns their own behavior. They understand it witnesses against their own sins and summons them to judgment. So we have the two aspects, right? It's like the depth of the Bible and the contradictions and stuff, they won't understand. The message of salvation, they will think is foolishness. But the one thing they will get, anyone in the world will get, is the fact that the Bible condemns their living, their lifestyle, right? And that's the number one reason why the Bible is more attacked and more vilified and more, you know, condemned and more banned and burned than any other book is because nobody enjoys having someone tell them that their point of view is wrong. And the Bible is interested in saving us, and so it's going to tell us the truth. Which would you rather have? A friend that tells you only what you want to hear 
or a friend that tells you what you need to hear. The one who tells you what you need to hear is the true friend. Now, hopefully they do it with kindness. Nobody needs to be told what they need to hear uh, in a way that is rude, but we're assuming here friend, right? So a person who loves you will tell you what you need to hear. Well, the Bible is God's love letter to us. And God loves us too much to withhold the truth from us. Does that make sense? And so then the Bible contains the words of life, which sometimes are going to offend us, but we have to recognize the, where it's coming from. And it's coming from a heart of love. And how do I know that? All you have to look at is what God did for us. God, through the person of Jesus Christ, the Bible says, right? For God so loved the world, John 3, 16, that he gave us his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. And what did Jesus do for you and me? But he died on the cross for you and me. So does Jesus love us? You better believe it, right? And so then if he, God loves us, he put his money where his mouth is, so to speak, God didn't just sit on the throne and tell us what to do. He came down to this earth and demonstrated what it looks like to do what he's asked us to do. He put his money where his mouth was, such that then when we read the Bible and we hear things that might be hard, harsh, or offensive to us, we need to recognize that it's not God that needs to change. Amen? It's not the Word of God that needs to change. Who needs to change? We need to change. And if it really as a society, if, and certainly in the Western society, if we had not abandoned the foundation of the Word of God and of the Bible, we would be in a much better place today as a society than we currently are. And one of the reasons why society in general, both in Western society and the world, are shipwrecking themselves and we're headed towards catastrophe and chaos is because we have denied God and given up on the Word of God. So are you open to the truth? Are you open to the Bible, to the possibility the Bible is from God, that it is the word of God? Jesus said in John 8, 31, 32, Jesus said to the Jews who believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And in John 14, 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Another offensive, offensive message. The Bible is clear. The New Testament is clear. There's only one way to be saved, and that's through Jesus Christ. You can't be saved through Buddha. You can't be saved through Muhammad. You can't be saved through uh, any other uh, faith, Joseph Smith, any of those things. The only person who will save you is Jesus Christ. And that is an offensive message today, but it is the truth. And I hope you would rather hear the truth than to just have your ears tickled. Because ultimately, right, we can be, you know, we can be in, a, in a building. Imagine being in a building in the upstairs, right? And your house is on fire in the downstairs, but you're just blessfully unaware. And somebody comes by and throws a rock and breaks your window of your house. You come out to the door and you go, what's the meaning of this? Why would you go and break my window? And the person at the ground floor is saying, your house is on fire. Your house is on fire. Are you going to continue being angry with the person? You'd be, no, you're going to have to spring into action to save yourself. You might even have to jump out of the window in order to save yourself, right? But the point is, is then you're grateful for the person who's doing the thing that at first you're upset about and would otherwise be in normal circumstances, an offensive action, but you understand the intent behind it, which is to save your life. And really, that's what the Bible is about, and the message of the Bible, and that's what Jesus is trying to get people. He told them the truth, because it's the truth that you need. And ultimately, I could also say here, right, the truth is a who, not a what, right? So the truth is found in the person of Jesus Christ, and where do we find out about Jesus but through the Bible? That makes sense? God only reveals himself to those who are truth seekers. And that's the why I ask you if you're finding the truth. If you are a person who's watching this or listening to this and you're unsure about the Bible, you have to ask yourself, are you a truth seeker? Are you wanting to know the truth? There's a famous uh, movie of the Matrix where there's a red pill and the blue pill. And it's like, if you take the blue pill, you can just go on blissfully living your life in ignorance 
and ignoring life and just believing whatever you want to believe. But if you take the red pill, it's going to be hard, it's going to be unpleasant, it's going to be difficult, but then you're going to really know the truth. And of course, in that story, the character Neo takes the red pill and, and goes through this whole experience of recognizing the world is way worse than they ever thought. And, you know, that is true. We have that same experience when we come to know Jesus because this world is a much darker place and is headed for much greater catastrophe than anyone out there realizes. The difference between us and the story that's done in the Matrix, this fictional story, is the fact that we also know through the Bible that we have good news ahead. That we have a God that's coming to recreate the world. That this world isn't going to be inhabited by robots or artificial intelligence. It's not going to be destroyed by a nuclear apocalypse where there's nothing left on earth. It's not the cockroaches or even the, the apes that are going to rule the earth. Okay, It's going to be... God and the saints that are going to rule the earth. And so there's good news ahead. But how do we know that good news? We have that hope because of the Bible and our belief in the Bible. So are you open to the possibility that God exists and that he has a message for you and me? Right? Jeremiah 29, 13 and 14, it says, You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. I will be found by you, says the Lord. So God seeking. If you seek after God, God will show himself to you. If you want to know the truth, God will reveal the truth to you, for, for you. You have to be open to it. The Bible approaches things from God's perspective and not ours. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, says the Lord. For as high as the heavens are from the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. And so really, if we want to connect to supernatural power, if we want to connect to supernatural love, if we want to connect to the supernatural future that God has planned for you and I, then we must connect to the Bible because that's where we're going to find the truth, the words of life that are going to bring us on into the right relationship with God. Now, some people try to say the Bible's corrupted. Hasn't it been corrupted, Right. Well, no other book has been more carefully preserved than the Bible. Uh, Bernard Ram has this to say. He says, Jews preserved it as no other manuscript has ever been preserved. With their mazora, they kept tabs on every letter, syllable, word, and paragraph. They had special classes of men within their culture whose sole duty was to preserve and transmit these documents with practical, practically perfect fidelity. Whoever counted the letters and syllables and, um, and words of Plato or Aristotle, Cicero or Seneca, there's, that's the Old Testament. And then when we talk about the New Testament, we have tens of thousands of manuscripts, and, and some of those date all the way to only 30 years after Jesus. And those two, because they're considered scripture, have been carefully and faithfully preserved. So I know that, for instance, the Quran makes the accusation against the Bible that it's been corrupted. But I guarantee you that if there's any document between the two that'd be corrupted, it would be the Quran and not the Bible. And so, you know, we can trust in the fidelity of the Bible. And, and this doesn't even scratch the surface of textual analysis. I could talk to you about the Dead Sea Scrolls and how they found a copy of Isaiah. We, the earliest copy we had was, was something like 600 years after Christ. And then we went and found the Dead Sea Scrolls and it, it gave us a copy that was like 800 years earlier. And when, when they examined those two copies to see how much error had been transmitted, there was like 17 words or something that had been affected in, in an entire document of 66 chapters. And none of those substantially changed the meaning of the terms. And so you just look at that in one book, but the Bible, the Bible we hold in our hands, we can know is the Bible that was written down thousands of years ago because God saw to it that it would be faithfully transmitted. We can trust it. Uh, John Warwick Montgomery says, to be skeptical of the resultant text of the New Testament books is to allow all of classical antiquity to slip into obscurity, for no documents of the ancient period are as well attested bibliographically as the New Testament. And we'll, you talk about whether what's mentioned, right? The, the Iliad, Homer's Iliad, you talk about Cicero, Aristotle, you could talk about even Shakespeare's only 400 years ago. You know, there are many passages in Shakespeare where they're not 100% sure what some of the headings are, and yet you never, ever hear of anyone questioning Shakespeare. Why? Because it doesn't have the words of life, and Satan's not worried about Shakespeare. He's worried about the Bible, and so he wants to transmit error. 
And so if you want to find doubts, you can find the hook to hang your doubts. But if you're interested in the truth, there's plenty of evidence here to suggest that the Bible is, in fact, God's Word. And the Bible that we have is the same Word that was written down thousands of years before. And the, te- the Bible itself testifies to its uh, importance. Uh, just that for, We've read those two verses before, but just right. All Scripture uh, is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, right? So Paul himself is pointing to the Old Testament. And he's saying, look, if you look at the Old Testament Scripture, it's profitable. It's worthwhile. And the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So the, the Bible has the words uh, of God. And uh, according to J. Barton Payne, he wrote uh, an encyclopedia of biblical prophecy. He listed 191 prophecies of Christ that were fulfilled. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to go through 191 prophecies today. (laughs) If you want to, you could read the book, okay, or look for it on Amazon and read it. But uh, suffice it to say that prophecy is one of the ways we can look at the supernatural uh, origins of the Bible. Because there are many, many hundreds of prophecies in the Bible that were given and had come to pass. And there's way more than you, I mean, again, this could be a 40-hour course. It probably could be a 2,000-page book of going through all the historical details of this. Whole seminars, I've, I've conducted even a whole evangelistic seminar where much of it was, was on prophecy we could get into. I'm just going to touch on a few with regards to Jesus, key prophecies about Jesus. Uh, one is his first advent. It's predicted in Genesis 3.15. It's predicted in Deuteronomy 18.15, in Isaiah 96 and 28.16. Uh, in Genesis 3.15, it says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between her seed and your seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. We know from Old Testament and New Testament, this is talking about Jesus. Okay, now here, if you don't have biblical knowledge, you might look that and not see the reference, but we see, we, you know, it's, it's a fulfillment of prophecy. Uh, Moses was told by God uh, that there was a prophet. The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren. Uh, him you shall hear. Right? Isaiah 9, 6 says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. This is super clear because no one else in all of history can have the claim to divinity like Jesus Christ. Amen? And yet this points to this child that was going to be being born in the future, and that person was fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. And then we have John 1. This is the fulfillment of it, right? John writes in John 1, 1 to 3, says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him, nothing was made that was made. And then a few, uh, verse 14, we have it being pointed directly to Jesus. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So this is a fulfillment of Scripture. God, Jesus coming in person as a man, but also as fully God. And he himself made those statements to say, before Abraham was, I am. And, and he uh, attested to the fact that he was the Messiah and he was, he was also divine. Which flies in the face, for instance, of the Quran that tries to say that Jesus was just a good man. He was a good man, but he wasn't the Son of God. The problem is then, is if Jesus himself attests to his divinity, and yet he's not God, then guess what that makes Jesus? A liar. And how can a good man be a liar, right? Another uh, key prophecy about Jesus is uh, predicting his forerunner. We see this in Isaiah 40, verse 3, and Malachi 3, 1, and 4, 5. Uh, Isaiah 43 says, The one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And uh, Malachi 3, 1 says, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. And then in um, Matthew 3, we see that fulfillment. It says, In those days John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who is spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. So we see in the New Testament how they're connecting what was in the Old Testament. And so the writer of Matthew, he's connecting this for us so that we can see that John the Baptist is a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. 
This was predicted in advance. Another key prophecy is his mission, mentioned in Genesis 12, 3 and 49, 10 and Deuteronomy 18, 18 and 19. We'll just read Deuteronomy 18, 18, and 19. So I will raise up for them a prophet like you among their brethren, and he will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And it shall be that whoever will not hear my words with him, which he speaks in my name, I will require it of him. And so the Israelites, the, the Jews, were waiting for the Messiah to be that great prophet. In fact, you see this when they were questioning John the Baptist. Are you he? Are you the prophet? And he's like, no, I'm not. And who are you? They were looking for that prophet as the Messiah. And we see that fulfillment in the person of Jesus Christ. And then the last key prophecy is his passion. And I'll just, there's, you know, I'll just look at Psalm 22. And, and by the way, this is just a tiny, tiny sampling of 191 prophecies. Okay, but Psalm 22 is an amazing fulfillment because here, we have this first verse, which anyone who's heard or read or seen anything about Jesus' crucifixion will recognize. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? Where do we hear that verse? Where do we see that verse? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? At the crucifixion. It's the words of Jesus himself. He, he cries out, right? Well, he's quoting this psalm when he's doing it. And so then anybody who's there who knew, and many of those... I would say all the religious leaders had most of the Bible, the Old Testament, memorized. And when he quoted this, they would have, their mind would have immediately gone to that psalm. And when you start reading it, that psalm, it is an amazing fulfillment of the crucifixion, right? If you continue, it says in verse 6 to 8, it says, But I am a worm and no man, a reproach among men and despised by the people. All the, those who see me ridicule me. They shout out, they shoot out their lip, they shake their head saying, he trusted in God, let him rescue him, let him deliver him, since he delights in him. Did they call that out on the, in this cross? You better believe it. They were doing that. They were ridiculing him, right? In verses 14 to 18, we read, it says, I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax that has melted within me. The very fact of the crucifixion being pulled out like that, your joints literally would pull out. It's all part of that. And of course, the heart melt is like wax that is melted within me. What happened when they, after he died, right? They thrust the spear in his side. And what came out? Blood mingled with water, right? And so it was a fulfillment of this. It says, my strength is dried up like a pot's herd, and my tongue clings to my jaws. What did Jesus cry out? He cried out for water, right? I thirst. And instead they gave him gall to drink, right? And you have brought me to the dust of death, uh, for dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. Now, David wrote this psalm. Did David ever get his hands and feet pierced? No, clearly it's talking about Jesus. I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. Exactly what they did to Jesus, right? In fulfillment of prophecy. And so to me, if you read the entire psalm from one, verse 1 to 18, you will see all of it speaks to the experience of Jesus Christ. And it is a powerful, powerful testimony of the fact that this was predicted hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus was crucified. And it was fulfilled completely in the person of Jesus Christ. And so these are powerful testimonies. I could point you to Isaiah 53, which is the suffering servant, which points to Jesus. There are so many allusions in Old Testament that points to Jesus and uh, we could talk about the sanctuary and all the aspects of the sanctuary that points to Jesus, right? Where, Paul, where, where, uh, where John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, which points back to the Old Testament sacrifices, which all pointed back to Jesus. And what do all of these point to? They point to the fact that God himself is the author of the Bible. And God himself is the one who spoke these things in advance so that you and I would know that he is in control of all history. He is in control of the sin problem. He's going to resolve it once and for all. And Satan is already defeated in the person of Jesus Christ. And one day soon, we're going to be able to see him face to face. Amen. We can have confidence in the fact that scripture predicted things like this crucifixion to know that this book is not just any other book, but it is a book of life. It is a book that will give us 
um, eternal life if we will listen to it. In Matthew 25, 35, we see that fulfillment of the casting of lots, right? They crucified him and divided his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. An amazing uh, fulfillment. So if you take the odds, this is uh, Peter Stoner in a book called Science Speaks. He talks about the fact, the odds that eight prophecies would come to pass, and, you know, eight prophecies of Jesus in one person would come to pass. He says the odds are one in 10 to the power of 17. So that would be one followed by 17 zeros. How many of you would like your odds on that? Imagine that was the odds of the lottery. How likely would you be to win it, right? These odds are already so big as to be impossible. And he calculated that if you, uh, if you went to 48 prophecies, it would be one to the power of something like 157, 157 zeros after it. Okay, quite literally impossible. And there are at least 60 major prophecies of Jesus that were fulfilled in the Old Testament. All of these point to the fact that we can, in fact, trust the Bible. Amen? That the Bible is a book that has the words of life and will tell us not just what may come to pass, but in fact what will come to pass. The Bible is clear. This world will be judged. There is an end coming. Sin will not continue forever. The wicked will not continue forever. Jesus Christ is coming back. There is a reckoning coming, and each of us have to come to grips with that. We can choose to live our lives like the ostrich that puts his head in the sand and just lets life pass you by, but that freight train is coming. That thousand-foot tsunami wave is coming, and if you do not prepare, if you do not go to high ground, if you do not cling to Jesus, you will be destroyed. Each of us has a choice. We can put our heads on the sand and ignore this truth, or we can recognize that you are here because God wants you to hear it. You are watching this because God wants you to, to know this truth, that his word is his love letter to you, and that you can trust in him, and he will guide you if you will just believe. Because ultimately, that's what it's at, right? We have to believe. John Wesley, founder of Methodism, had this to say. He says, this book had to be written by one of three people, good men, bad men, or God. It couldn't have been written by good men because they said it was, it was inspired by the revelation of God. Good men don't lie and deceive. It couldn't have been written by bad men because bad men would not write something that would condemn themselves. It leaves only one conclusion. It was given by divine inspiration of God. Amen? We each have a choice when faced with the truth, right? The evidence ultimately is there for us if you are willing to be convinced. And the final thing, really, that we all have to ask ourselves is what will you do about it? After you know the truth and God has convicted you to be the truth, and if you've watched this and you've felt that conviction, that's the Holy Spirit speaking to you and confirming it to you, then you have one choice, and that choice is to do what the book tells you to do, right? These are the words of life. And if we will believe on those words, then they lead us to the one who gives Christ. And if we believe in Jesus Christ, then the Bible says, as I quoted John 3.16, whoever believes in me will not perish, but have everlasting life. And so may God find each of us holding fast to the word of God, who cares what the culture tells us is right or wrong? Let us hold fast to the word of God and stand on that word, knowing that it is the eternal word of God that will always, always has been and always will be. And that one day soon, by God's grace, through faith in the person of Jesus Christ, all of us can be together praising God in eternity in a land that has no more sickness, no more sadness, no more pain, no more death. Choice is yours. Will you believe or will you harden your heart? I really sincerely hope that you will believe.